today, personal rebirth, personal birth through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you must be born again. The Apostle Paul wrote, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. I've chosen this particular theme today because it's a very special day for me. 40 years ago this day, I was born again. 40 years ago, this is my... I'm, uh, I'm all right for 40, eh? Very, very special moment. I became a new creature in Christ. Many people couldn't put a day on it. Uh, just a, a season where they changed. Perhaps it's not been a dramatic, sudden thing for you, as it was for me. But uh, I'm going to begin with testimony today. And this is not a shameless plug, but uh, I'm going to read it uh, from this devotional I put together uh, at the beginning of lockdown last year, Born Again. And the reason I'm going to read it from this devotional is because I'll do it much quicker that way. I know if I read it, I'll be over in two minutes and we'll get into the message because although I'm sharing testimony today, I'm just an exhibit in the witness stand. It's all about him. It's not about me, it's about him. But I'd like to read what happened in my life 40 years ago today. He took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. It was 2 a.m. on Saturday the 6th of February, 1982, and bitterly cold. I was shivering in the darkness outside my hall of residence in Glasgow University. I'd lost my keys and could barely remember where I'd spent the hours partying. There was one window lit up against the blackness of that night, and I launched a handful of pebbles up at it. That's the actual window, by the way. Paul came to the window. We knew each other. The last time we'd been out, his friend had supplied me with marijuana that I'd mixed with far too much alcohol, leaving me flat on my back in a stairwell in Charing Cross in the city, physically unable to move or even cry out for help. My life was a mess. My overdraft limit was reached. I barely attended classes, and I was close to eviction from that residence. A chain-smoking nervous wreck. My ever-expanding weekend binges had now squeezed the weekends out in between. Even my more riotous friends were now withdrawing from me as my personality began to change. It was serious, and everyone knew it. I have no idea about how it happened, but Paul and I began to talk about God in that room. So I began to tell, about, tell him about an Indian cult leader who had converted a friend of mine. He reached to his shelf and picked up one of his books. It was called The Bible. And he began to read. And as he read, a heavy weight fell upon me. God's presence filled the room. I knew I was living in complete rejection of him. Tears filled my eyes as I whispered over and over, forgive me, Jesus, forgive me, Jesus. Paul looked up, startled, and asked, what's happening, Alistair? In a moment, he too was weeping his way back to God. Around 12 Christians lived in that large residence None of them had any idea of what God was doing under their roof at four o'clock that Saturday morning. But a pre-dawn sunburst had just exploded in my life. By the end of the following year, that band of 12 grew at its peak to 35 Christians squeezing into a little room in there week by week. It all began with the most hopeless wreck that God could find in the place. I thank God. Thank God for new life. This is more than a teaching. This is more than a doctrine. It is that. 
It's more than a belief system. It's the life-transforming power of the living God today. The God who said, let there be light, spoke into my life that morning 40 years ago today and said, let there be light. And the light hasn't gone out in 40 years. I want to thank God for it. After the glory of creation and the repeated interventions of God in history, I'd like to read from Romans, I beg your pardon, Ephesians chapter 2 and the first three verses. And I want to ask the question, how did we get there? And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. How did we get to that place? Several weeks ago, I, alluding to Scotland's wonderful, glorious past, history and how the gospel lit up this nation and when the gospel lit up the nation everything else lit up too the education system uh, the the economy academia everything just exploded through uh, centuries of light in this nation but how did we get for example from an education system that was set up specifically and explicitly to pro propagate the knowledge of God through the scripture and the gospel of Jesus Christ to the place where, where today in our schools all kind of stuff is promoted by our government, by our education system. I, I know it well uh, as a former registered teacher. How did we get from there to there? I don't want to go into all that today. I just want to ask, how did we get there from there? How did we get from there to there? The same way that I got from a little boy whose daddy put his hand on his head and said, this boy will go into the ministry one day. I remember sitting in bed one day just as a little boy and I was off school, I don't know what for, I was reading my Bible and one of my mom's friends walked past the bedroom door and saw me sitting in my bed reading a Bible. I couldn't have been more than a seven, eight, or nine, I don't know how old I was. And she said, that's a good boy. And when she said that, I felt a warmth within me. How did I get from that to the substance-abusing, foul-mouthed, nervous wreck teetering on the brink of complete breakdown 40 years ago last night? How did I get from there to there? The same way as Adam, who left sweet fellowship with God in a paradise of abundant provision, to rejecting God and choosing death instead, expelled from the Garden of Eden, toiling to eke out an existence and experiencing the unthinkable heartbreak of seeing one of his sons murdering his own brother. How did he get from there to there? How such a fall? How could it happen? Satan found entry into Adam's heart and into his mind and into his life through a pride that made him believe the lie that he could somehow survive and prosper outside of a personal relationship with God and simple obedience to the doable things that he'd been asked to do. At the moment we reject God, we find ourselves beginning, it may happen quickly and dramatically, it may happen slowly and subtly, but the moment we reject God, we find ourselves fallen into a state of spiritual, psychological, social freefall that will never end until someone comes to save me from me, to save us from ourselves and the things that ourselves have chosen. Sorry about the grammar. The 
prophet Isaiah wrote, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face so that he does not hear. God is light. And God is life. It follows then that the rejection of God through sin is death to our souls and darkness to our lives. The worst thing about Adam's act of sin was that he took the whole lot of us with him. Just as we would have done had we been him. Adam's sin placed in the DNA of the human race an internal tendency towards sin. We all inherited a default position, a bias, a downward gravitational pull towards doing wrong. Even when we've been warned of the circumstances and sometimes even when we're trying not to do it. Paul wrote to the Romans, the good that I want, I do not do but I practice the very thing that I do not want. Even the noblest among us who haven't plummeted the depths of depravity, those we might call the good living, find themselves condemned by the words of a fallen King David, quoted again by the Apostle Paul, there is none righteous, not even one. Who among the so-called good is the one who will cast the first stone. Arguably, the greatest sin of all is self-righteousness. The folly of believing that any child of Adam is able to produce righteousness in and of him or herself. The greatest enemies of Jesus, his crucifiers, were not the prostitutes, swindlers, and demoniacs, but the outwardly stainless, The self-reliant, who not only felt that they had no need of Jesus, but even saw him as a threat to their own personal sufficiency. Sufficiency, in inverted commas. Such people are still his primary crucifiers today. They despise the cross with the same humanist cry. You didn't need to come into this world. We can manage this thing ourselves. We can pull it together. We can solve the world's problems with our own ability. The gospel of Christ, the message of the cross, is an offense to the pride of man. Offensive. It requires self to come to a place of humiliation that's beyond the contemplation of the pride. And yet that place of brokenness is the only gateway to salvation. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus said. The poor in spirit, those who are conscious of their spiritual poverty, who find themselves in the place of felt need. Blessed are they, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Greatest sermon ever preached, surely. Sermon on the Mount. You see, it doesn't matter whether we're outwardly impressive or not. The man wearing expensive boots is no more able to lift himself off the ground with his own shoelaces than the man with no boots at all. If anything, the impulse to reach down for our own shoelaces leaves leaves the wealthy man a step behind the one who's already barefoot and crying for help. Paul declares that we all, every one of us, fell in Adam. We are all sinners, excluded, lost, estranged, without hope, and without God in this world. I'm only quoting the Bible. In a dark place, until the light comes, until someone says, let there be light. I quoted a moment ago Isaiah chapter 59 And verse 2, let's back up and read the verse immediately before it to set the context of light. 
Verse 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor his ear so dull that it cannot hear. God sent a savior to the world because the world was incapable of saving itself. Sending Christ our Savior in the world was too great a price to pay had there been any other way. And there wasn't, and it certainly couldn't have been found in us. The same God who came to a fallen Adam and Eve and covered their nakedness with animal skins sent his son as the sacrificial lamb who would take away the sin of the world. This is the good news. Jesus Christ took our sin upon himself. An astounding transaction took place on the cross. Our sin was exchanged for his righteousness. Our death was replaced by his death, and we received his life. Our darkness was expunged by his light. That's the good news. Listen to how my great friend Phelan Doherty puts it. I quote him here. He says, the gospel is not good advice. It's good news. There's a profound difference between the two. Good news is the news of something that has already happened that benefits me. Good advice can only be something that hasn't yet happened, but might happen if I follow the advice. You'll never be saved by something you're trying to do, only by what he has done. Here's the good news. Peter writes, Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. That's the gospel. That's good news. That's something to shout about. That's something to get excited about. Here's the answer. We're the solutions people. Back to the text began with Ephesians chapter 2. It doesn't end in that place. How did we get there? Verse 4 says this. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. Salvation is a free gift to sinners who have realized their hopeless plight and discovered that salvation can only be provided through the Savior, can only be received by faith, as the light of the gospel of grace explodes in our souls. Christ's sufficiency now replaces my deficiency. My salvation stands on what he has done, not what I'm trying to do. My righteousness is a priceless gift that I could never pay for, much less improve upon. And all the time, I'm protected from the original sin of Adam's pride by the knowledge that the entirety of the glory must therefore go to him. He is all my righteousness. I stand complete in him and worship him. Thank God. This is why we fall down and worship him. This is why we get excited. This is why we passionately sing out his praises. We're not trying to impress him. We're being moved by how impressive he is. Have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal savior? Him completely and nothing of you to commend you to God? Have you trusted him that way? As your one and only justifier? as the one whose very own righteousness opens up the gates of heaven for your entry. If 
by faith in him alone. That's the gospel. That's the good news. It's something that has happened because of what he did. If you haven't done that, lift your eyes to the cross today. Lift your eyes to him, where he, to the cross, where he did your salvation. Surrender your eyes to the light of the gospel and open your mouth with a prayer like this. Let's pray. If you've never settled your eye and had it settled in your heart that he alone is my source and therefore completely sufficient means of salvation, look to him today. Pray these words. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross to pay the price for my sin and to bring me back to God. I receive you now as my Savior and confess you as my Lord. Enter my life by your Holy Spirit and make me the person that you created me to be. Join me to your church, your body, and show me your purpose for my life. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, and maybe you've prayed it before, but the light of it didn't dawn upon you. If you prayed that prayer today and want to find out more about Jesus, text us, message us. If you're following online, we'll get you a book that will help you in your faith. And get in touch with us and find fellowship. Grow as a Christian with others in the family of faith. We're in the building today. Don't leave without seeing Pastor Ola, myself, Barbara, any of the other leaders here. God has a wonderful new light. You may know already. We thank him for it. The Lord bless you. So good to be here today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you for each one. In Jesus' name.